Okay. Mr. Clerk, the first bill is LB 268. Mr. President, with respect to 268, I have a series of motions to return. Senator Coash is being the first, but I have priority motions, Mr. President. Senator McCoy would move to bracket Legislative Bill 268 until April 16 of 2016. Senator McCoy, you're recognized to open on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I rise today uh, to bracket this legislation because I feel strong enough to have this discussion again this morning on final reading. Perhaps one last time, perhaps the second to last time this body will discuss this issue this session. I'm not sure, and I said this on select file, and I believe I also said it on general file, I'm not sure that I can think of another issue that we faced in my seven years here in the legislature that I feel stronger about. I had an early initiation into the overarching issues surrounding the death penalty, as I talked about on general and select file, because in 2009, my first year in the legislature, we passed legislation moving Nebraska from the electric chair method of execution to lethal injection. As many of you know and I've talked about, I went to college in Norfolk. I know Madison County pretty well. Done a lot of business there over the years. I've seen firsthand just what an impact tragedies like the bank shooting in Norfolk make the imprints that makes on a community forever. I've had a chance to be quite a bit in Scotts Bluff and know that the tragic, tragic crimes that have been committed by those who sit on death row in that community and in that county, what impact that's made there. I've had a chance to spend quite a bit of time in Richardson County. Decades later, what happened in Rulo still reverberates. And Rulo and Falls City and Humboldt and other areas of southeast Nebraska. And that's just to name a few. Not to mention the crimes that have happened in Omaha and Lincoln and elsewhere. All these years in Nebraska, we've kept the death penalty because as a legislature and as the people of this state, we've said that the ultimate punishment should be reserved for those that have committed the worst of the worst offenses against their fellow Nebraskans. It was said on select file that this issue gets to the core of who we are as Nebraskans, and that's true. That's why it was unsuccessful, but that's why I brought the very serious amendment to put this as a constitutional amendment to make this a vote of the people. People feel pretty strongly about this, both for and against getting rid of the death penalty. But it's my belief that the vast majority of Nebraskans believe that we should keep the death penalty. And I'd ask you to consider this morning, members, as we have this discussion, to think about what justice looks like in Nebraska in a landscape in which we don't have the death penalty. I'd ask you to think about the five-year-old little boy just two short weeks ago in my district that was thrown off a bridge, no previous signs of trauma according to the autopsy report, to drown in the darkness at the hands of his older brother and his older brother's girlfriend. I'd ask you to think about the fact that the reason the Douglas County Attorney Don Klein it's pressing for the death penalty in that crime is because that murder was committed to cover up 
and to get rid of a witness to the previous murder of his mother and the young boy's mother. And I would ask you members to think about that crime because it's very applicable to what we're talking about this morning. Because I would ask you, without the death penalty, what was there there to even give a hope that that crime wouldn't have happened to that brother? Because guess what? That crime would get committed with no way to give those who committed the crime any worse sentence than life in prison. So what value, I ask you, does that young five-year-old boy's life have if we don't have the death penalty? What value? Because what more can we do than to give the perpetrator of that crime life in prison? But instead, with the death penalty, that's an aggravator and grounds to press for the death penalty. And that's an appropriate thing to have in our justice system because perhaps, perhaps, not in this crime, but in a future one or in past ones, that might have been enough to prevent somebody from murdering this innocent little boy. And then I ask you to think about, members, the recent riot at the state prison in Tecumseh. Now, thank goodness no guards, no corrections officers were among those who lost their lives in this incident. But even with the two inmates who did, we may never know who committed those murders, but we may find out someday. And I would ask you members, just like David Dunster, who sat on death row until he passed away recently, let's just say, for instance, it was someone at Tecumseh who already was serving a life sentence who committed the murders of those two inmates last weekend in Tecumseh, what greater punishment can we give them without the death penalty? What's to prevent, other than solitary confinement, which we've talked about the problems with that, what's to prevent further bloodshed in our prisons without the death penalty? David Dunster committed two murders while on death row. Not in Nebraska. He came to Nebraska to sit on death row. But he committed two murders in other prisons. If all you have is a life sentence, what value is life even in our inmates in prison? What value is the lives and safety and the well-being of our corrections officers? I ask you members to think about that this morning. What message are we sending? Because in all the hours of discussion on this issue, I challenge those who support the repeal of the death penalty to give me one good reason, because they haven't been able to do it to this point, and I believe it's because they can't, to give me one good reason to answer what I've just brought before you. To me, that's compelling enough reason to stand before you this morning and to fight this to the absolute finish. Because to me, inmates' lives, while they're serving time and they are behind bars, are still of value. If they didn't get sentenced by a jury and a judge to be put to death for their crimes, then they don't deserve to die. It's irrespective of what crime they were in prison for. They didn't get sentenced to death. But two inmates at Tecumseh died at the hands of other inmates. That wasn't, that wasn't the sentence that was handed down to them. One minute. But that was the justice they received at the hands of other inmates. We know we have a problem in our correction system. We know there have been many corrections officers that have already quit at Tecumseh after last weekend. What message are we sending to our already troubled corrections system to get rid of the death penalty and to say, you already have a tough job, we're going to make it tougher because now 
you and your families don't know that if something tragic happens to you while you are serving as a corrections officer in our prisons, there is no recourse if that person who perpetrates such a crime is already serving a life sentence. I ask you to think about this. Is this the message we want to send to Nebraskans? Time, Senator. Thank you, Senator McCoy. Those in the queue are Senators Bowles, Williams, Seiler, Campbell, Kalowski, and 25 others. Senator Bowles, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Over the last decade, the murder rate in non-death penalty states has remained consistently lower than the rate in states with the death penalty. Of the top 10 countries with the lowest murder rates across the world, some have capital punishment, some do not. Colleagues, the way that we can make an impact on public safety is not through taking a life. It's through the work the Education Committee does to give people opportunities. It's through the work the, ju the Judiciary Committee does to protect the public safety and support law enforcement. It's through the work of our communities and our neighbors and our friends and our churches. And colleagues, I'm proud to rise in support of this piece of legislation, in part because I am a person of faith. And I don't speak of that on this floor very often, but as a representative of the people, and of someone who campaigned as a person of faith, I do feel compelled to say that I feel as though I am representing the people of Nebraska when I represent compassion and when I represent the idea of redemption. If we are people of faith, we can't only believe in the pieces um, about giving ourselves up to God or, or about um, what it means to, to obey the Ten Commandments. We also have to give ourselves up to the idea that redemption is possible and invest in it in our choices in this body. So colleagues, I encourage you to join me in support of LB 268, and I yield the remainder of my time to Senator Koash. Senator Koash, you're yielded three minutes and 14 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Bowles. I've spent time uh, thinking about the people of Nebraska and how LB 268 reflects it's people. I believe that Nebraskans believe in what, doing what's right. I believe that Nebraskans believe that all life is given to them by their creator, that we have limited time on this earth to do our best, and that he will call us home and we'll be judged by him. And I think this is a pretty good plan, one that I feel that the government should not be interfering with. When a person violates that plan, there has to be justice, and innocence must be protected. But justice delayed is justice denied. When we delay justice, we deny it. And both sides, I think, can agree on that. Our system has been cruel to victims, and we tell them justice is served, but it's not. It's cruel. Senator McCoy talked a little earlier about our corrections officers. And yesterday, I turned in a resolution that was signed by every member of this body thanking the corrections officers for the work that they do. And we did this because we value their work and because they deserve our recognition. <clears throat> Some have spoken about their lack of hesitation in exacting death on someone who has harmed their loved ones. As a husband and a father and a brother, I understand that. No one of us would get that opportunity, however. Instead, we're going to ask one of these corrections officers to do that. No discussion on this debate up till now has been given to what we will be asking a state employee to do if we ask them to participate in an execution. On different bills, we've had discussion, colleagues, on conscious. Who among you would ask a state worker making $15 an hour to participate in a killing? I had the opportunity to talk to some former corrections officers in states where they've executed people. 
And everyone that I talked to said, that doesn't go away. And some of them even said they volunteered for the job thinking they were executing justice, but after that was done, it was traumatic for them. It hurts them. Colleagues, I'm not ready to ask a corrections officer of any level, a lot, one who just started all the way up to a warden or a director, I'm not ready to ask them to participate in a killing on behalf of our state. I couldn't do it. Time, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you, Senator Bowles. Thank you, Senator Koresh. Senator Williams, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. We have been elected to our roles here in the legislature to make hard decisions. Decisions that uh, for many of us come right at the root of our being, and this is certainly one of those decisions. But we as senators sitting here have never backed away from making those hard decisions. You look at the week we had in the legislature last week, extremely difficult week. Prison reform, medical marijuana, license, driver's licenses for dreamers, the death penalty discussion last week. I was glad to go home at the end of last week, and I'm sure the other 48 of you were also. But the sun came up. We came back to these jobs to face making decisions to create the right path for our state. As I mentioned last week, the process that we have gone through on this has been new to me and several others, but I did have the opportunity to sit in the hearing at the Judiciary Committee on LB 268. There were a number of people, I think about 20, that testified in favor of repeal. Some of those were family members of victims talking about how they are haunted by the death penalty and how it continues to bring back the horrible memories that they have of not being able to have closure with their situations. I also would remind everyone here that there was only one person that came and testified in favor of maintaining the death penalty. That was Don Klein, county attorney in Douglas County, public defender, excuse me, excuse me, county attorney in, in Douglas County. From that, the Judiciary Committee advanced LB 268 to the floor on a unanimous vote. You've heard the statistics, how many people have been convicted to death in our state, how many we have actually executed, which is 23, and the 11 people that we have currently on death row, one of which who is currently on hospice. This past Sunday afternoon, several of us had the opportunity to tour the Tecumseh prison. And one of the things we had the opportunity to do was walk in and stand on death row. Stand and look at those people who are there that have been committed of the most heinous crimes in our state. I looked at the person that committed the murders in Norfolk in the bank. He was pouring a cup of coffee. Other than the clothes he was wearing, he didn't look any different than you and me. The question that we have been asked today is where do we go and where do we step forward? Senator McCoy asked us to think about justice. Justice means different things to different people. Is it vengeance? Is it retribution? Is it punishment? Is it revenge? We have an alternative in our state One minute. and in our modern society, thank you, Mr. Speaker, today that has not always been there. And that alternative protects public safety. And that alternative is included in LB 268, the concept of life imprisonment without the 
possibility of parole. At the end of day, as I've told people, you can't nuance this decision. It's green or red. We make that hard decision, and, and as I've said before, I would not attempt to change anyone else's mind, but I am confident and comfortable with God watching me in my decision. I will vote green for LB 268. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Senator Williams. Senator Seiler, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the unicameral. I'd like to follow up a little bit with what uh, Senator Williams was just talking about. Back on May f or March 4th, we had a hearing before the Judiciary Committee, and uh, you can pretty much explain the people that were proponents, and there were 14 of them, uh, and one person uh, was an opponent. Uh, one of the uh, tests, I love refer to a couple people's testimony. One is Lauren Smith, Senator Lauren Smith, who you all know. And uh, I think he summed it up best. He said, therefore I believe that the de uh, deterrent factor is non-effective. How did he reach that conclusion? Real easy. It's been 19 years or 18 years since uh, the execution has been uh, carried out in the state of Nebraska. Uh, we've had that death penalty on the books all during that period of time. Think of this statistic. In North Omaha, there's been 21 murders since January 1st. 21 murders with the death penalty on the books. What a great deterrent that is. Lauren's right. It's ineffective. It doesn't work as a deterrent. I was interested in uh, Senator McCoy's uh, definition of uh, this recent murder where it was thrown off the uh, bridge. The gentleman hasn't been convicted yet and he was wanting the death penalty. Whoa, let's get our priorities straight. You need a trial first. You need a conviction second, and then the jury that makes the conviction needs to look at the mitigating circumstances to decide whether those mitigating circumstances presented constitute sufficient grounds for the death penalty. It's not as simple as uh, was drawn out for you. That takes time, work, energy, and lots of money. Lots of money. Again, Warren, or Lauren is correct. The only witness that testified for the death penalty was Don Klein, the county attorney at Douglas County. And he testified on behalf of the Nebraska County Attorneys Association to oppose LB 268. Listen to his testimony. But I do question sometimes that here I am in the trenches, filing cases with aggravating circumstances, asking a jury to make that determination of a three-judge panel, when the state can't get its act together. When the state can't get its act together as far as the penalty itself. And there's no assurance they're going to get their act together after 19 years. That is the predominant uh, elephant in the room. It isn't a deterrent, it hasn't been used, and it's worthless. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I give my time that's left to uh, Senator Coash. Senator Seil, thank you. There's one minute left, Senator Coash. Thank you, Senator Seiler.
want to, in my brief time, finish my comments on the corrections officers. Remember what we'd be asking someone to do on our behalf. Participate in the killing of another human being. How do we do that as a state? How do we say to a worker, whether they believe in it or not, this is part of your job. You get 15 bucks an hour. Walk this guy to the death chamber. If you weren't willing to do that, if you weren't willing to Time be that correct, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Coyne. Senator Campbell, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, in preparation for our, our discussion on LB 268, I spent time reviewing the emails that I had received um, on this bill, both those who would support its repeal and those who would support that we retain it. And I also went through the written materials or letters or notes that were in the folder um, as we have accumulated them. And I agree with Senator McCoy that their feelings are very strong on both sides. But I wanted this morning to give voice to a couple of letters that appeared in newspapers in the state because I do think that people who take time to write into a newspaper have strong feelings and they might be helpful to be shared. On April the 21st of 2015, Ben Backus of Gehring wrote to the Star, Star Herald. I was encouraged to see the Star Herald question the use of the death penalty. LB 268 is probably one of the most important bills this session. It removes the ability of our government to render a judgment of death on its citizens. At a time when our opinion of government is at an all-time low for good reason, do we really want to trust in the ability to decide if someone should live or die? There are other reasons that you already mentioned, such as the cost for appeals and lack of fairness in the penalties. One thing you did not mention is that it can provide closure to a victim's family without the emotional roller coaster of multiple appeals and hearings. I have heard people cite the Bible in defense of capital punishment. Fortunately, Jesus is the way and the life and the, not the Old Testament. Jesus never condemned anyone to death. And with that, I'll yield the rest of my time to Senator Chambers if he would like the time. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Chambers, you're yielded two minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the legislature, I've been dealing with this issue for over four decades, and never has there been the kind of support among the legislators themselves as has occurred in this instance. There have been people who describe themselves as conservatives all over the country and in political office who have spoken in very pragmatic, what you might call realistic terms about the exorbitant cost, the randomness of the penalty, the fact that the appeals go on endlessly. It is not something that functions in the way a governmental, and they call it this, program should. And in line with their views that ineffective governmental programs should be done away with, they now come out strongly against the death penalty and seven of our colleagues, which never would have happened in the past, who defined themselves as conservatives, had a press conference in the rotunda declaring openly that this penalty ought to be done away with. Retired Land, uh, Sarpy County District Judge Ronald Reagan, who is on the sentencing panel that sentenced John Jubert to death and he was executed, said he has been against the death penalty. He carried out his duty because that's what his job as a judge was, but he and all the judges he talked to want this penalty to be done away with, and if you read his testimony, One you'll minute. see where he said he hopes the legislature will do it. Thank you, Mr. President. That was the one-minute call, Senator. Oh, that was one minute. Yeah. This is not a time 
from my position to rail against anybody for whatever it is that they believe. I think, as Caesar may have said it, the die is cast. People who have cast a vote for abolition gave what I'm convinced is a principled vote. They will continue to do that. Those who are opposed to the bill, there's nothing I can say to change their mind. So we have this time before us, and the opportunities I have to speak, I shall. The record should be crystal clear on what it is we're doing. It is historic. We have the opportunity to take a one small step for the legislature, a giant leap for time, civilization. Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Chambers. Those in the queue, Senator Kalowski, Senator Crawford, Garrett, Kanhar, Hansen, and others. Senator Kalowski, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Senators. It's a very important day for all of us. I stand in support of LV-268 and against this bracket motion. I want to take this small amount of time to talk about something that's very important within this context of the death penalty and of our the whole issue of jail time and penalties and that's dealing with the forensic science field itself my oldest son is a csi guy he's had 12 years of service in new york city and the past three years in the washington dc area he's a dna specialist by background we have an issue within the forensic the forensic science field and the issue is very simple. It's separation of prosecutors and law enforcement from their local forensics lab. The issue is one within individual states and within the national level that we are battling and we've had that issue take place within our own state in the last few years. Labs must be independent, must be separate from both the prosecutor's offices and the law enforcement in their individual states. It's all about power and politics in controlling and dealing with the evidence of cases. Extremely important concept that is in challenge across the country at this time. Lastly, the National Innocence Project has freed hundreds from false incarceration and from death row over the history of that particular project. Thank you for that opportunity, this opportunity to speak to that issue at this time. I yield the rest of my time to Senator Chambers. Thank you. Senator Chambers, you're yielded two minutes and 55 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kalowski. After just saying I won't rail against anybody, I must speak very harshly against what the governor is doing. I had written a rhyme that says, who knows why politicians lie? Who, pray tell, can say? We need no need to ponder, neither to wonder. Tis in their DNA. The governor is press conferencing now saying that with this bill not having the words without parole means that life doesn't mean life. His own attorney general said in a statement, you ask whether apart from a pardon board commutation does the absence of the words without the possibility of parole open the possibility of parole for an inmate sentenced to life in prison? The answer to your question is no. The governor either is not talking to his attorney general or he's deliberately misleading, which is the definition of a lie. In Nebraska, life cannot be anything other than life unless the pardon board gives a commutation. The Supreme Court has made it clear that the words without parole have no significant meaning and the legislature has never been able to show one because in either case, life means life unless the pardon board commutes. If the pardon board does not commute a life term to a term of years, it means life. That's the way it always has been. That's pursuant to the Constitution. And if those words were put in the bill, it would give the public a misconception. First of all, they would think that it's possible to be paroled 
unless the words without possibility of parole are present. The parole board cannot consider anybody for parole who has a life sentence One right minute. now and with the bill that is the same way. This bill is to have no surplusage. It is not designed to create any misperceptions. So when the governor says what he did, he ought to ask his attorney general, was he speaking correctly? I will say categorically, a life sentence in Nebraska right now means life without possibility of parole. Now, if we put without possibility of parole, that cannot restrict what the parole board can do. I mean, the pardons board. We could say, and we mean that the pardons board cannot commute. Well, the pardons board's power is based on the Constitution. The Constitution allows the pardons board to commute any life sentence. So, I hope that these comments will clarify that issue. And if I haven't made it clear, I will answer it again. Time, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You, Senator Chambers. Senator Crawford, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. I stand in opposition to the bracket motion and in support of LB 268. You've already heard many pieces of evidence from supporters of 268. Um, providing evidence that the death penalty does not provide a deterrent effect. Senator McCoy asked, I thought, an important question, well, what about prison deaths? Is it a deterrent for prison deaths? So, and that we had not put that evidence on the record. And so um, I will do that now so that we will have that evidence on the record. Colleagues, in data from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, we know that between 2001 and 2007, states with the death penalty had prison deaths over four times the rate of prison deaths in states without the death penalty. That is the evidence. States that have the death penalty had a rate of prison deaths four times the rate of prison deaths in states without the death penalty. So I think that puts to rest the question of whether or not the death penalty provides a deterrent effect on prison deaths. Now I'd like to turn to the question of justice more broadly. Quite often, so proponents of the death penalty talk about the need for justice. And as Senator McCoy spoke, he talked about the need for healing in communities. And colleagues, when we think about justice in the state of Nebraska, we need to think about more than just the person who committed these heinous crimes. In fact, perhaps we have a higher duty of justice to those victims and their families, a higher duty of justice to the innocent people in the community who are now suffering the effects of that terrible crime. And that's what we heard from victims' families in this debate. They want us to consider their justice. What's just for them? And the person that I got to know uh, most closely was Dr. Ashley Gage, a social work professor at UNK. And she spoke movingly of how grateful she was that in her case, her father's murder was not um, a case that ended up being handled with the death penalty because she had closure and she could move on. I want to add to the record what we know actually from social science studies about the impact of the death penalty on victims, victims' families. A 2012 Marquette Law Review article compared the experience of homicide survivor families in Texas, which has the death penalty, and Minnesota, which does not. In a longitudinal study over 16 years, the researchers found that survivor families in Minnesota displayed higher levels of physical, psychological, and behavioral health. For example, Texan families had almost double the amount of ongoing trauma reactions and depression than Minnesota families. The study also found that despite claims of justice for families, 
The death penalty offers limited healing potential and does not bring closure for Texas families. Part of this lack of closure stems from the lack of control due to the length of appeals process. These families, often 10, 15 years post-sentence, face permanent limbo of uncertainty. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Not knowing if and when the case would move forward. Some families here in Nebraska have been in this limbo for almost 30 years. Colleagues, justice for the victims' families think, compels us to support LB 268. Justice for those accused also compels us to support LB 268. We have situations in which people are wrongfully accused, and we have evidence in many cases that it's not just the hundreds of over 100 cases where people have been exonerated who have a death sentence. We have many other cases where people have been exonerated um, because they gave pleas due to the fact that the death penalty was a part of that process that led to those inappropriate, inaccurate guilty pleas. Time, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Crawford. Those in the queue, Senators Garrett, Ken Har, Hansen, McAllister, McCoy, and others. Senator Garrett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, good morning, Nebraska. For me, this is fundamental. I rise in opposition to the bracket motion and in support of LB 268. I've said it on the mic before and I'll say it again, I'm pro-life. From conception to when God calls somebody home, I'm not going to quibble over describing innocent life versus those who are guilty. For me, it ultimately, ultimately is a matter of conscience. I'm not a Catholic, but the, the Pope and, and the Archdiocese in, in Omaha have all come out uh, in support of the repeal. You, we can talk all the, the pragmatic data you want to talk about, whether it uh, serves as a, de a deterrent or not, uh, what it costs, the fact that we have two people on, who've been on death row for 35 years, that, that to me seems like it's cruel and unusual punishment in and of itself. But, uh, but ultimately, at the bottom line, you can say all you want with all the other things. It's a matter of conscience. You either believe in life or you don't. I, I, you know, I, I didn't want to get up here and, and, and get too deep into religion, but uh, you know, when Jesus was crucified, think about his words, his last words on the cross. He didn't look down at those Roman centurions and say, I hope you fry for what you've done. He said, forgive them. I uh, uh, don't want to make a political issue out of this, and uh, this is not a conservative liberal issue. This is a matter of conscience. Uh, and I, I will be voting for the repeal of the death penalty, and I'd like to yield the rest of my time to Senator Al Davis. Senator Davis, you're uh, yielded 30 minutes. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. I, can, I don't think I can go on for quite that long, but, um, and thank you, Senator Garrett. I wanted to Three talk- Three minutes, a, not 30. I wanted to talk a little bit about some cases. I, I've, I stand in opposition to the bracket motion and I stand in support of LB 268. I think there are so many reasons why we need to eliminate the death penalty in Nebraska and in the United States because it's fundamentally unfair and it's fundamentally a terrible mistake and, and bad justice. And so to do that, I wanted to talk about some specific cases, one of which is a young man, a, not a young man at the time named Ron Williamson, and I handed out this morning a photograph of him after he was released from death row in uh, Oklahoma. So Mr. Williamson had dreams just like all people do. He wanted to aspire to be a major league baseball player and he played on a scout team for the Yankees. He was charged and convicted of murder in Ada, Oklahoma, served many years on death row, I think 11 years on death row, came within five days of being executed by the Oklahoma uh, state. When he was convicted, he was mentally ill. He had bipolar disorder. He had schizophrenia. He was 
convicted in part by uh, some bad forensic evidence that was put together by an investigator in Oklahoma named Joyce Gilchrist dealing with hair and DNA evidence. He also had a public defender who fell asleep regularly in the afternoon. He was violent in the court. He was offensive to people. People were convic convinced that this man was guilty. And after he died, John Grisham wrote a book about him, and the book's known as The Innocent Man. It's a great read. I recommend everyone reading One that minute. book. Thank you, Mr. President. And the things that uh, John Grisham had to say, I think, were very profound. He talked at the University of Virginia School of Law in September of 2006 after he'd done a lot of research on the death penalty and on the Williamson case. And there's a couple of quotes that I think are so important. He said, even if you support the death penalty, you cannot support the death penalty system as it stands in the United States. And then the last thing that he said after he'd done this, I should mention also that Mr. Williamson had a friend who was also convicted and sentenced and was later pardoned. But the last thing he said, Mr. Grisham said when he spoke at the University of Virginia Law School, he said, one thing this book taught me is that there are a lot of innocent people in prison. Colleagues, the state should not ever risk sentencing someone to death who might be innocent. And that can happen. It nearly happened in Nebraska with the stock case. Time, it, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Davis. Senator Shoemaker would like to recognize Dr. Jeff Gottschall of Columbus, who is serving as Family Physician of the Day on behalf of the Nebraska Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Gottschall is under the North Balcony. Please rise and be recognized. Senator Ken Har, you're recognized. Mr. President, members of the body, uh, I would request uh, the remainder of Senator Davis's 30 minutes, if I could. Denied. <laughs> Denied. Uh, we have a tough speaker. Um, I rise in support of LB 268 and against the bracket motion. Um, and what I would uh, like to talk about is uh, sort of a follow-up to what Senator Shoemaker said the other day in a very poetic manner. And what it boils down to is that I look at the upcoming vote on LB 268 as a vote, of, do we go forward as a civilized society or do we go backward? Uh, and if you look at the history of capital punishment in this world, um, wow, as recently as the Middle Ages, you know, public capital uh, punishment was a family affair. People would come with their kids and they would, uh, they would bring picnic lunches and uh, it was a celebration. Uh, maybe not too much unlike that one that uh, Senator Koash describes some years ago here in Lincoln. And I just think we have to get away from that. Uh, we just have to say, no, that the state taking a life in this way should not happen. And let's be done with the issue. Let's, let's mete out justice in the way of uh, life imprisonment, and let's be done with this one. Uh, obviously, we have other areas in our society where the debate should never go away. Uh, the First Amendment is one of those. You know, it's so well crafted that we're going to debate the First Amendment forever. Uh, and the issue of free speech and what is and what isn't and how important it is to us. And that's very good. But with the death penalty, I think we need to take the civilized step forward and say the state will not execute people. Let's just be done with that. And let's go on. Let's met out justice. Um, I, I am also impressed to just watch what's going on right now in our own legislature uh, with, with um, corrections and prison reform. 
And here's an area where I think we're becoming more civilized. We're realizing that uh, incarceration goes beyond, uh, the issue goes beyond punishment and revenge and those kinds of things um, and costs us money and we're becoming more civilized and we're learning to deal with that in a way that mets out justice uh, but gets beyond just those feelings of let's, let's lock them up. So, you know, when we're born, we aren't civilized. That's the whole purpose of parenthood and civilization itself uh, as it moves forward changes what those norms are and how we civilize our children and I just feel that in this issue we should move forward become One more minute. civilized get rid of the death penalty and move on from there learn better ways to deal with uh, the people that end up in prison and the protection of our people and with that I give the rest of my few seconds to Senator Chambers should he like them. Senator Chambers, 38 seconds. Thank you. Mr. President, members of the legislature, with these snippets of time, I'll try to make the most of it. The bill that reinstated the death penalty in this state in 1978 or whatever it was had the same number as this bill, LB 268. So the circle will be completed when a bill bearing that number, LB 268, marks the demise of the death penalty in this state. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Chambers. Senator Hansen, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. While I was trying to formulate my thoughts on this, um, not my thoughts on this matter, my thoughts are clear, but my words on this matter this morning, I read a letter that was passed to my desk and the name uh, caught my attention, so I wanted to read that into the record. I was published uh, in the Lincoln Journal Star on May 17th of this year, entitled Repeal the Death Penalty. Because I have lost three loved ones to murder, I feel pain and outrage when I hear politicians say we need the death penalty for cases they deem the worst of the worst. This is an absurd notion. Studies have shown that the death penalty is applied arbitrarily. Don't look me or any other victim's family member in the eye and dictate that our loved one's death wasn't the worst of the worst. In each case, complete heartbreak and devastation result. It is cruel to rank our losses. We pour millions of dollars in endless media attention into a tiny percentage of cases and offer nearly no assistance to most victims. It sends the false message, your suffering is less important. The death penalty creates an artificial distinction between those cases deemed worthy of seemingly infinite resources and the vast majority of us who aren't even given the basic support to help rebuild our lives. This distinction is an unnecessary harm to victims, but it's inevitable we're going to keep going in such a rare and, uh, rare and expensive punishment on the books. The solution is to repeal the death penalty. This was from L. R. Hansen of Lincoln. Uh, with that, I would yield my time to Senator Davis. Senator Chambers, you're yielded three minutes. Senator Davis, three minutes and 22 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. I was talking a little bit about the stock murders in 2006 my last time at the mic, and I wanted to touch on that again because to me the issue of potentially putting someone to death at the state, when the state makes that mistake is just not tolerable. That's why I stand so strongly against this. So if, just to refresh those people's memories about those murders, it was a farm family in Murdoch, Nebraska. The next day, they, the uh, other family members had thought there had been a conflict between their nephew and them, so the police began investigating their nephew. He was held for a lengthy period of time, started to uh, listen to the police, and the police were kind of feeding him information, and eventually he confessed that he had done that murder. He had murdered them, and he implicated a friend of his, another cousin, I believe, and that person also was brought in and there was more discussion and he confessed. Down the road, the police investigator was having a hard time finding evidence. That car had actually been detailed the next day, which looks like more implication that these people had been guilty of the crime. It was detailed early in the morning the next day, cleaned up. No evidence found in that car. 
Later, David Kofid, criminal investigator from Omaha, discovered blood evidence in the car that implicated those two young men. But there was a troubling piece of evidence that was found at that crime scene, and that was a ring. And on that ring, a very unusual ring, was written, Love Always, Corey and Ryan. And there was a jeweler's mark on that ring. So the investigator, Christine Gabry, she called the jeweler, who happened to be going out of business. And this, this story is just an incredible story, but the jeweler was going to go out of business and was closing the store that particular day, I believe. And the jeweler said, yes, I do remember that ring, and uh, it's a very unusual manufactured ring. So the jeweler was able to go through records. They made a lot of phone calls, the investigator did, and she found the person who had who that ring had been made for. And that ring was in a pickup that had been stolen in Wisconsin two or three One days minute. prior to, thank you, Mr. President, prior to that murder. On the basis of, and they found that pickup, they found those two people. The evidence then indicated that it was a young man and a young woman who'd driven off the interstate, killed the Stock family to try to rob them. Things kind of went bad then. But um, the point being, Mr. Kofi had planted evidence in that car, which wasn't right. That was a terrible injustice. And the, he was eventually charged and convicted. And Mr. Mock, who was the, I think, special investigator, he told 2020, but for the finding of that ring, Livers and Sampson might be on death row right now in Nebraska. Colleagues, that's why we need to do away with the death penalty. We can't trust the system anymore. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Davis. Those in the queue, Senator McAllister, McCoy, Morfeld, Stinner, Brosh, and others. Senator McAllister, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, like the rest of you, I understand the gravity of the situation that uh, we are facing this morning. It's a decision that requires prayer and deep reflection. We have all heard the conflicting statistics on murder conviction, error rates, uh, whether an execution truly is a deterrent or whether the relative cost of execution versus life in prison uh, are, the, are, the, are the most expensive or the cheapest for the state. I've come to, to, to believe that the statistics a, ten, a senator tends to believe follow your core beliefs. Those statistics uh, you, you cite uh, can be easily refuted by the, the opposite party. So what's most compelling to me are some of the testimony of those families that have been touched by murder. Let me read a letter, sign on letter repeal of Nebraska's death penalty, and it's actually from the families of murder victims. We are individuals and families who have lost loved ones to murder. At the moment, none of us could have predicted or prepared for a tragedy robbed us of children, parents, spouses, brothers, sisters, and other family members. Our direct experiences with the criminal justice system and struggling with grief had led us to believe to the same conclusion. Nebraska's death penalty fails murder victims' families. We never asked to be in this position and would do anything to change it. We realize, however, that nothing can erase the loss of that senseless act of violence brought into our lives. We can honor the memory of our loved ones and other families who may face tragedy by working for effective responses to violence. The reality of the death penalty is that it drags out the legal process for decades. In Nebraska, the death penalty is a false promise that goes unfulfilled, leaving victims, families frustrated and angry over um, years of fighting the legal system. Victims, families, in capital cases go back to court for years on end, where the press replays the details of crime again and again. The result is the case never comes to an end. The system burdens our vast majority of cases that don't result in the death sentence. As the state hangs on this broken system, it wasted, wastes, wastes millions of dollars that could be go f uh, toward much needed victim services. The death penalty is said to be reserved for the um, particularly heinous murders. We have difficulty understanding this position. 
The implication is that other murders are ordinary and do not merit the death penalty. From experience, we can tell you that every murder is heinous, a tragedy for the, the lost one's family. The death penalty has the effect of elevating certain victims' families above others. Nebraska should be better than that. I yield the balance of my time to Senator Chambers. Senator Chambers, you're yielded one minute and 34 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McAllister. The date when the death penalty was reinstated in Nebraska, the year was 1973. The bill was LB-268. It was introduced by Senator Dennis Rasmussen. I was in the legislature at that time. I was against his bill. I am the introducer of LB-268 in the year 2015. Nebraska will step into history by abolishing the death penalty. This will be the first so-called conservative state to have done so. Nebraska was the first state, thanks to assistance I received from my colleagues, to call for divestment of public funds from South Africa. The federal government followed, the country followed, and now Nebraskans are proud of what they did. I think once this becomes an accomplished fact, everybody is going to accept it because there are many people in Nebraska who think there is no death penalty now anyway. If this bill, not if, when it is passed and when it becomes law, nothing is going to change. The death penalty is not used. And we don't have to go to another state to show what happens in prison. If any prisoners know that there's a death penalty, those at Tecumseh know, because that's where death row is housed. Not Time only is Senator. death row housed there, they have 11 men on death row. Time? Time, Senator. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Senator President. Chambers. Senator McCoy, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Would uh, Senator Chambers yield, please? Senator Chambers, will you yield? Yes, I will. Thank you, Senator. Was the Obama administration wrong to press for the death penalty on the Boston bomber? I cannot respond to anything about whatever anybody else did. Anybody who is for the death penalty, in my opinion, is wrong. Okay. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. Um, the Boston bomber just received a a death penalty sentence is all of us know that have been watching the news. The reason that this was pursued federally is because the federal government still has the death penalty. The state of Massachusetts does not. So this individual who perpetrated a tragic loss of life and the maiming and disfiguring of so many individuals in Boston received the death penalty, death sentence for those crimes. Senator Chambers also mentioned and I handed out a press release from Governor Pete Ricketts from a short time ago. His very firm and emphatic opposition to LB 268 and he vowed to veto it. Governor Ricketts clearly stated, and I agree, a vote yes on cloture on this bill is a vote to repeal the death penalty. And I would ask you, if you disagree with me on this, I'd ask you, members, to go take a little uh, informal straw poll among your constituents and ask them about United States Senator Ben Nelson's vote on Obamacare. Because let me tell you what it was. You know, how many, how many folks in Nebraska do you think realize that Senator Nelson actually voted no on the underlying legislation? He voted yes on cloture. And I'd, I would ask you to go ask some of your constituents whether you think he voted yes or no on Obamacare. They know good and well what cloture means. They know what a cloture vote means. And it cost one of our longtime serving United States senators, it arguably cost him his job. I would tell you to think long and hard on this. 
Those of you who may think that, well, I'll just give a cloture vote on this issue and I'll vote no on the bill. No, a cloture vote is a vote to repeal the death penalty. You know, I also want to talk about, as I did in my remarks on select file, and, and I would say this to, to Senator Seiler in response to what he said about my comments. I didn't pur purport to say that this individual who allegedly committed these crimes, one of the murders that took place in my district, I didn't imply that he'd already received the death penalty. I very clearly said that Douglas County Attorney Don Klein is pressing for the death penalty. I of course believe, as I hope we all do, and I'm sure we all do, that in our country you are innocent until proven guilty, not the other way around. One now, minute. this individual admitted to the crimes and reported himself, turned himself in at a police station. So, Senator Seiler is correct. This individual has not received a trial yet or a conviction or a sentence, but he's admitted to the crimes. You know, I'd, I'd also like to talk about the lives, the families, as I did on select file, who are in favor of the death penalty. Sure, there are some who are not, and I respect that. But we have justice in our country and we have justice in our state for a reason. Time, Senator. Thank you, Senator McCoy. Those of the queue, Senator Morfeld, Stinner, Rosh, Ebke, Panzing Brooks and Nordquist. Senator Morfeld, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to the bracket motion and LB 260, or excuse me, in support of LB 268. And I have not talked much on this issue because I've always made my position in support of the repeal very clear. However, the reason why I oppose the death penalty is because just as I believe strongly that no individual has the right to take the life of another, nor should the state. And as legislators, we determine the power of the state to either take a life or not. And that's what LB 268 is about. I have to reconcile those two things and that's why I'm opposed to the death penalty. Because just as I believe no one has the right to take the life of another, the state should not have the power and authority to take the life of another as well. Many people on this floor have talked about justice. One member has openly wondered whether or not this body believes in justice. Justice has many forms and many different definitions. I was just looking in the dictionary and one of the definitions is fairness. The principle of moral rightness. Again, just as those individuals that have taken the lives of others unjustly, I do not believe that the state should have a right to take the life of another as well. And many of my colleagues this morning have laid out the reasons why. That we have often a flawed justice system. And not by any fault of any particular person. I know many people on both the public defender side and the prosecutorial side who are upstanding prosecutors and public defenders. But because none of us are perfect and we cannot create a perfect system in which we know for a fact whether justice has been served by the state killing another human being, just as we know that it is wrong for another human being to take the life of another. The governor and Senator McCoy has asked me to listen to my constituents. Well, I have. 
And overwhelmingly, they have told me in my district at least, and I know many of your districts may be different, that the death penalty is a moral wrong. But I also ask that you listen to yourself. Because in our representative democracy, we are sent not just simply as direct representatives of our constituents, but also we are sent here to know the facts and to gather the information and listen to the debate and make tough decisions, informed decisions. That is the cornerstone of a representative democracy, is well-informed representatives who understand the facts, dive into the issues, listen to the debate, and make tough decisions. And they may not always coincide exactly with a straw poll in your district. I know that vengeance in particular is a powerful feeling. But I ask that we step back and remember that we are charged with the disposition of justice and not just vengeance. And that is exactly what I believe the death penalty is, is vengeance, not justice. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator McCoy brought up what I believe are some veiled threats, that a cloture vote is a vote to repeal the death penalty. Well, I suppose if dishonest people make those claims and call that a vote against the death penalty, then I suppose some people will believe that. However, we know here that a cloture vote is to end what we call filibuster and to make it so that a bill can have its day, an either up or down vote. So if dishonest people in this body want to make that threat and then perpetuate that threat to members of this body, then they can go forth and do that, but they are dishonest then. Remember, we should not be using vengeance to create policy. I've had wrongs committed against me as an adult, and even wrongs committed to me as a boy. Time, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Moorfeld. Senator Stinner, you're next. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to yield my time to Senator McCoy. Senator McCoy, you're yielded four minutes and 53 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Stinner. I would remind Senator Moorfeld, I'm not offering any sort of a veiled threat. I have no way to carry out any threat, nor would I threaten anyone. This vote is up to each member. I'm just merely, remind, merely reminding members of this body just a few short years ago in a nationally and globally scrutinized vote, a former two-term governor of this state and a two-term United States senator was forced to retire because of a cloture vote and the outcry in his home state of the great state of Nebraska. Cloture is voting for this bill. That's not a threat. That's not rhetoric. That's reality. You can call it cutting off debate. So did Senator Nelson. He tried that move. Didn't work for him. And he had a way bigger bully pulpit than any of the 49 of us do. The people of Nebraska are very intelligent. They're savvy. They're watching this debate. They're keeping track of this issue. Why do you think I brought to you the amendment to put this to a vote of the people? You know, lest anyone forget, that amendment received 22 votes. And I didn't ask for a call to the House, and I didn't ask for a roll call vote. So clearly there's a number of, of members of this body who thought that this should go to a vote of the people. I don't want to steal Senator Groney's thunder. He has a handout that I think is very, very good for this discussion this morning, the Sword of Justice and Lady Justice. I can't yield him time because Senator Stenner yielded it to me. And I know he'll have an opportunity to talk about it later. But I would ask you members, take a look at that picture. What is in the right hand 
of Lady Justice. It isn't a set of keys. The left hand are a set of scales, scales of justice. And the right hand is a sword. It's not a set of keys to a cell block for life in prison. That's why that sword is in that hand. Because in America, we recognize with our justice system that there are appropriate punishments and sentences and consequences for appropriate crimes. That's why the federal government still has the death penalty. You know, I'd ask you also, members, to consider the fact that we have a President of the United States and a Department of Justice that has sought at every turn in the last seven years to prevent pharmaceutical companies from manufacturing and selling the drugs required for lethal injections to states to carry out justice. But yet, did you see the federal government and this president make any move to abolish the death penalty in the federal government? No. And I would ask you, members, why is that? Because even this president, who I respect as I respect any president, recognizes that when you deal with crimes like an Oklahoma City bombing that we just, uh, that we just commemorated, a 20th anniversary for, with Timothy McVeigh, who was executed for, the, for that crime, that even the federal government recognizes for some crimes, death is the only appropriate punishment. That's why I rise this morning. That's why I'm passionate about this issue. Because the ultimate chronic punishment should be reserved for those who have committed the most heinous crimes against Nebraskans. No, it's not used frequently. It shouldn't be. But it should be there to use. Time, Senator. Thank you, Senator McCourty. Senator Bross, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. How appropriate, Lady Justice. That's exactly what I was going to speak on this morning. And she does hold a sword. And Lady Justice is shown with an unsheathed sword ready for use in the interest of justice. And that's from Hinkle and Farm in 1959, page 234. The interest proclaimed here marks judiciary action or enforcement of justice. Lady Justice is depicted holding a double-edged sword in her right hand, which tropes the outcome of those deliberations for or against litigating parties. In the double-edged sword, we find two embedded meanings. One, a sword represents the enforcement of justice or judgment. Two, a sword that represents protection of the law or defense. Just opposing these two ideas, we formulate this double-edged sword or the requirement of punishment and defense. I wanted to add that 32 states retain the death penalty, as does the military and the federal government. I represent three counties in Northeast Nebraska, constituents overwhelmingly support the death penalty. That's where I call home. Where I reside while in session is in a Northeast Lincoln neighborhood. They have echoed their support in retaining the death penalty. This legislature made national news, Fox News and other, not very long ago. Your decision today, I believe, will also make Fox News and national news. We'll repeat history again. And Senator Chambers, I congratulate you. You said it took 40 years 
to find a legislature of kindred spirits, at least on this issue, because it seemed like yesterday we were not worthy of our position and our post, that we were guilty of all sorts of crimes dating back generations and generations. You know, I for one believe that you listen to your constituents, you are mindful of what 40 years of legislators believed was just, what our symbol of justice, the scales, the blindfold, the sword, are meaningful to you, and that we not uh, fall or be swayed for what other reasons other than justice. In Northeast Nebraska, it is, it seems like yesterday. We still know of the horrific, murderous outcomes, the lives lost at the bank robbery. It's hard to forget that, even though it was a decade ago. People are asking for justice. With term limits, it seems like yesterday that I came here and took my post, but in speaking with other past servants, public servants, those who have served, they're also asking, why have we swayed in our One opinion? Minute. Why are our churches getting smaller, yet the need for public service growing larger and larger? Where is our core of values? And where are our positions when it when we need to make difficult decisions. These are not easy, these are not joyful, they are difficult, and we are deemed to make those decisions. And I'm not going to forget what 40 years of legislative history or further has, has uh, stood for justice and the sword. And I'm hoping that as you move forward in this day that you are mindful of those who you represent. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Senator Brosh. Those are the cues, Senator Epke, Pansy Brooks, Dartquist, Schnorr, and Baker. Senator Epke, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, today we are facing probably um, the most emotional and difficult decision that any of us, certainly any of us freshmen, have had to make. And we've been told time and time again that we should be um, listening to our constituents. But if your district is anything like mine, you have heard voices on both sides of the issue. You've heard those who have been very much pro-continuation of the death penalty, and just as many, in my instance, uh, who have uh, been very much in favor of repeal. Um, I got a, a letter from one of my constituents yesterday, um, one of those young constituents, um, and her name is Ella Murray. And she wrote me this letter, and I thought I'd, I'd like to share it with you. It says, Dear Senator Ebke, my name is Ella Murray, and I'm nine years old. I am from Deschler, Nebraska. I don't think the death penalty is right. My dad told me about a man on the news who got it. Wow, some people have to get drugs, put them to sleep, and give them the bad drugs that make your heart stop. I think that's bad. I think you should change the name to life penalty and put them in jail for the rest of their lives. By the way, I think you should do something about jail members killing other jail members. I agree with Ella. P.S. Please tell the governor about my letter. Best wishes, Ella Violet Murray. Um, you know, no one denies the very horrific nature of some of these crimes that we've talked about. And I really do appreciate the sentiment that many of my colleagues have expressed um, and, and, and that many others have expressed that, that perhaps um, the death penalty um, ought to be an option for those who have, you know, who are the worst of the worst, who have committed the most heinous of all crimes. I understand that sentiment, but I can't define what the worst of the worst is. I think it was Senator McAllister who, who made, um, made allusion to that a little while ago. I can't define what the worst of the worst is. I can't define what the most heinous of crimes are. Um, if it's my child who is killed, um, they're all heinous. Doesn't matter exactly how they're committed. I think that's a difficult thing for us to define in statute, which, ma which makes 
the death penalty much more arbitrary in its, in its uh, um, execution. I told a group of constituents on Saturday, um, they asked me uh, about the different sides of the death penalty, and I talked to them about that for a little while, and this was in Bruning, um, a coffee we had. And I told them this. I said, you know, as a conservative, I don't trust the government to manage my health care, and I don't trust the government to do many other things, frankly. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that the government can be effective or efficient um, or always right. And so I'm not really sure that we can always trust the government to be absolutely um, right in the trying and the conviction and the execution uh, of those who've been, who have been accused of murder. For many of us, this is a matter of conscience. Um, it's certainly a matter of conscience for me, at least in part, but it's also a matter of, of trying to be philosophically cons consistent. If government shouldn't be trusted to manage our health care, um, which I think many of us in this room would agree, then why should it be trusted to carry out an irrevocable sentence of death? I would, um, Senator Scheer, who, who sits on the other side of this issue than I do, asked me a few minutes ago if I would give him a little bit of time um, in order to read a letter from a constituent and um, feeling um, the desire to be somewhat fair, I am going to yield him the rest of my time. Senator Scheer, you're yielded 52 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Epke. Um, I want you to hear from the true victims. In regards to keeping the death penalty, it is easy to see by the way you voted against it that you have never lost a loved one due to murder. For example, in our family, we lost a beautiful niece in the murders of the Norfolk Bank. It wasn't a robbery. It was an intentional shooting all caught on camera. They didn't ask for money. They just fired at people that were working there. This affects not only family, but especially their children to this day. And just as they were murderers, they're still alive, sitting in prison. They were sentenced to death. We clothe them, we feed them, we keep them warm, and we offer them privileges. Why? How much does it cost the taxpayers every day? Why worry about death serum being painful? They didn't worry about the pain caused both physical and emotional to those that so many. We ask you to consider this as you vote, how your I'm constituents Senator. want you to vote, and to stand also by your own convictions and consciousness. We pray you do the right thing. Marvin Elwood, Legene Elwood, Brent Elwood, Ruda, Reed. Thank you, Senator. Senator Panzing Brooks, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a painful subject. Senator Shear's correct. There are families that are hurting on all sides of these issues. The victims' families have spoken out many times on both sides, but there is clearly not consensus on this issue among victims' families. Miriam Kelly, the sister of James Tim, who was tortured and murdered, wrote in a letter to the editor earlier this month, quote, hear me clearly, the only thing the death penalty has done for my family is kept us in a tremendous painful limbo for 30 years. Shame on those senators who chose to dwell in the muck of sadists instead of thinking critically about the best policy option for our state. Their nonsense is exactly why the death penalty should be repealed, unquote. Of course, you can hear the pain in her voice, the anger all anger is rooted in pain and sorrow. The parents of the youngest victim in the Boston Marathon bombing last month wrote in, an, in a letter to the editor of the Boston Globe, Senator McCoy mentioned, yes, he got the death penalty, but they wrote, we understand all too well the heinousness and brutality of the crimes committed. We were there, we lived it. The defendant murdered our eight-year-old son, maimed our seven-year-old daughter, and stole part of our soul. We know that the government has its reasons for seeking the death penalty, but the continued pursuit of that punishment could bring years of appeals and prolong reliving the most painful day of our lives. We hope our two remaining children do not have to grow up with the lingering, painful reminder of what the defendant took from them which years of appeals would undoubtedly bring. For us, the story of Marathon Monday 2013 should not be defined by actions or beliefs of the defendant, but by the resiliency of the human spirit and the rallying cries of this great city. 
We can never replace what was taken from us, but we can continue to get up every morning and fight another day. As long as the defendant is in the spotlight, we have no choice but to live a story on his terms, not ours. The minute the defendant fades from our newspapers and TV screens is the minute we begin the process of rebuilding our lives and our family. Those are strong words. Strong words about the lack of closure which people claim the death penalty brings. Today we've had amazing discussion. Vote to continue to keep the death penalty because uh, it, the vote will affect how you might be reelected. Really? Look at what happened to Senator Ben Nelson. Vote Vote against LB 268 because uh, symbols of Greek and Roman allegory show we should do that. Senator McCoy mentioned what greater punishment is there if we don't have the death penalty? What are we going to do? What are, what are we going to do with the criminals that are in prison? Well, no matter what the top limit is, you still have the ability for bad actors to act badly. Clearly, death penalty inmates and death row inmates can commit further additional crimes. Hopefully, we are doing everything we can to protect our officers who are serving us and protecting us by keeping them away from our society. The arguments have been clear. Clearly, it's fiscally unsound. Clearly, it's applied inequitably. Clearly, retribution and revenge are not viable reasons for the continuation of the death penalty. Judge Reagan gave the example when he testified at the hearing this year that Jobert drove five miles with the newspaper boy in Omaha and he could have driven two miles to Omaha with no death penalty. There, there's no deterrence. Judge Reagan went on to say this causes disrespect for the law. And Bishop Ann Shearer from Missouri came because she held the hand of, of one of the inmates on death row as he was being killed. And, and sh her comments were, retribution never heals, it only destroys. Thank you, Mr. President. Please vote for 268 and against the bracket motion. Thank you, Senator Pansing Brooks. Senator Northwest, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator McCoy yield to a question? Senator McCoy, will you yield? Yes. Senator McCoy, would LB 268 become law if this bill received more than 33 votes on a cloture vote, but less than 25 votes uh, uh, on passage? No, I don't believe it would. Thank you, Senator McCoy. Clearly, uh, a cloture vote is not the same as the vote on the bill, and I'll just speak for my constituents. My constituents are smart enough to understand that. Um, and you can make the determination for your own constituents. You know, it's time for us uh, to stand here today to show courage. Yes, it's going to take political courage. Yes, it's going to take moral courage to stand here today and to repeal the death penalty in our state. It's crystal clear that the death penalty in our state is broken. It's being applied arbitrarily, and we're not able to even obtain what it takes to carry out executions in our state. And proponents of come to the point of pointing to a depiction of a Roman goddess as evidence, for, um, as evidence for maintaining the death penalty in our state. If, if we're going to follow uh, laws of Rome, you know, I printed out a list and there's a number of doozies in there, including one where a master can send his slave uh, to the beasts in the amphitheater as long as he has authorization. Um, obviously, we are beyond that. But if we are going to use that, how about we look fully at that depiction of the Roman goddess of justice and look at the blindfold. Justice is supposed to be blind. And right now in our state, it's not blind for the perpetrators of the crime, and it's not blind for the victims of the crime. It's not blind for the victims of the crime as we talked extensively on select file, because we have 235 first-degree murder convictions since 1973, since the death penalty has been in place. 16% of the murders. First-degree murder is the worst of the worst in our laws, but yet only 31 have resulted in death sentences. Only 2% of all murders result in death sentences. And since 1973, 
there's been three executions, less than 1%. Clearly, the implementation of the death penalty, it's not blind right now in Nebraska, and it's broken. We are picking, we have an arbitrary process right now to pick the worst of the worst. We talked about cases on select file, the one in Dakota County where a guy raped a two-year-old, suffocated her, and didn't result in the death penalty, resulted in life, where bodies were thrown into the Missouri River uh, and they wouldn't sink, so they slit the bodies up and threw them back into the river. A case in North Omaha where a shop owner was uh, bound with computer wire, head was bagged, and shot execution style, didn't receive the death penalty. Clearly, it is not being implemented with blind justice in our state. That's one of the reasons it's broken. Obviously, on Select File 2, we talked extensively about the uh, ability to, for our state to obtain the lethal injection drugs. May 28th, in 2009, Governor Heineman signed the bill replacing the electric chair with lethal injection. January 24th, 2010, the last U.S. lawmaker of sodium uh, thiopentanol uh, will no longer sell for executions. February 2010, uh, Governor Heineman approves the lethal injection protocol. January 7, 2011, corrections officials obtained sodium thiopentanol from India. They announced in January also that they have, are prepared to carry out executions. In April of that year, the Supreme Court set a date for Carrie Dean Moore. Then the DEA said corrections did not have a license to legally import. The Moore execution was postponed. In June, Nebraska obtains a proper drug import license from the DEA. October, they acquire a fresh supply of sodium thiopentanol. The Attorney General asked for an execution for Michael Ryan. Uh, Ryan asked the court to uh, remove the Attorney General from the case. The Supreme Court denies that. In January 2012, the court issues an execution uh, warrant for Ryan in February. Uh, a district court judge in Richardson County reviewed the protocol. Um, they reject the, rejected the concerns about that. A fresh batch was obtained um, in October 2013. Bruning states Nebraska needs a new lethal injection protocol. And here Time, we are Senator. still today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Senator Schnorr, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. When we started out today, the president announced, or the speaker announced uh, to over 25 plus people uh, in the uh, queue to speak, and senators started laughing. So shame on all of you for doing that. This is the most serious matter that we will ever discuss, and it started out with people laughing. What motivates you to make your decision? From my point of view, what motivates you to take this tool out of the hands of our judicial system? You know, I looked at some surveys, some recent surveys. Uh, there's a poll done in October of 20, excuse me, October 23rd of 2014 that 6 in 10 favored the death penalty. A Gallup poll recently 63% in favor. A KETV poll just since our last debate 77% in favor of the death penalty. So what's motivating you in your decision? Let's go talk about some recent history here on the floor of the Senate. Senator Chambers has recently talked about kindred spirits. Uh, but remember, if you vote in favor of this, you'll be known to have taken the side of a senator that uh, I believe has more murders in his district than all of the state of Nebraska combined. You'll be taking the side of a senator that on January 9th of 2002 sat here on the floor and handed out desecrated rosary beads 
uh, and uh, talked about the Catholic Church in a negative way. You'll also be remembered for siding with the senator that has said the police are his ISIS and where he would shoot first and ask questions later. Because that's who is uh, presenting this bill. And let's not forget uh, the recent boat trading that uh, I talked about. And it didn't take the, the media long to figure that out. So this small handful of senators, they have a chance to redeem themselves here very shortly. They have a chance to do the right thing, to do that redemption that Senator Bowles had talked about uh, very early this morning in the start of our uh, debates. For that small handful, remember now you are known as the embodiment of the negative perception of what people call a senator, but you still can redeem yourself. The Senator uh, Koash made some comments about uh, what the, uh, the folks will have to do that have to carry out these sentences. Our military is asked to do that every day. One minute. Thank you. I will yield the rest of my time to Senator Groney. Senator Groney, you're yielded 50 Thank seconds. Thank you, Senator. I don't know if I want it. You're doing a great job, sir. Um, Senator McCoy summed up Lady Justice better than I could and Senator Brash. One point you ought to look at that statue too. What hand is that sword in? It's in the strong hand, the right hand. You don't unseat a sword unless you're going to use it. I've heard how we evolved. Read the Bible, folks. That was 2,000 years ago. Some of that stuff is in there for 6,000 years. Has the human condition changed? Has it evolved? No, it hasn't. There's evil in the world, and civilized societies have always handled it. The death penalty is a moral right of a civil society. I will quote you. Time, Senator. I'll be up. Senator Baker, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Here we are just minutes away from taking a vote, one of the most important votes we'll ever make in this legislature. I stopped to think about why I was elected and what the people who voted for me expected me to do as their elected representative. I think they expect me to listen to the constituents, they expect me to study the information thoroughly, and then to apply my own judgment. I was known in District 30 to a, a fair number of people having served as superintendent successful, successfully for a number of years and known by others for having served in that area as a superintendent. I think generally people believed that I showed good judgment in my leadership of the school districts. Oftentimes I would seek to find a win-win solution to problems. I think a win-win is, is better than a compromise. However, in this case, we're going to be pushing a red or green button pretty soon, so there's no opportunity to try to find a win-win, no opportunity for a compromise. I'm going to be supporting LB 268, and doing so, I know that I'm going to please some of my people in District 30. I'm also going to disappoint some of the people, maybe even dismay some of the people in District 30. This is a, a nonpartisan legislature. We, we deal a lot of uh, complex issues, 
in these complex issues that we've dealt with so far, it hasn't been Republican or Democrat. It hasn't been a conservative or Republican split. Support for these things such as increasing the gas tax, previous votes on death penalty. There have been people all across the board, people who would identify themselves as conservatives, people who consider themselves, uh, consider themselves on the opposite end of the spectrum, and, and a whole lot of the rest of us in the middle. I think that I will yield the rest of my time to Senator Smith. Senator Smith, you're yielded two minutes and 12 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Baker, for yielding me some time. First, I want to, um, I want to thank my colleagues here today for serving, for serving the state of Nebraska, for serving your constituents. It's not easy at times. And it's, this is one of the most difficult issues to discuss and to debate. I certainly, it certainly is for me, it's one that leaves a knot in my stomach, and if it does not for you, something's wrong with you. And I think better of my colleagues, and I think better of the citizens that sent you here, than to judge you on how you arrive at your decisions and on your votes. Unfortunately, Senator McCoy is correct. Some elected officials, I really would hope not to believe it's those among us, but some cast their votes only to keep their job or to gain a higher elected office. One this minute. is not a job for me. This is service, and I hope it is for you. I don't think any one of us have taken this lightly. And many of you, like me, are conflicted. Thank you for struggling with this. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Chris, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Nebraska. When you're walking the streets, knocking on doors, <clears throat> and wondering how you're going to spend a thousand dollars a month and realizing that you're not doing this for the money you're doing it because you want to serve and in my life that's been an extension of service 21 years in the Air Force and now this legislature that I'm proud to be a part of and in that time I have never on this mic questioned the conviction of one of my fellow senators or shamed them publicly or privately. I have, however, been the victim of several potential censure motions for speaking my mind, and I'm pretty proud of that. I will say the same thing I said on the first two rounds of debate. I am a pro-life, committed, convicted person who believes in life from conce conception to natural death. I have come to that point in my life after 58 years of experiencing this world. Experiencing what happens to a child who is born in Southwest Asia, who's missing arms or legs, or who is not correct and being left in the desert for dead, because it's Allah's decision whether that child should live or die. I've seen that. I've seen what happens in Chop Chop Square, where the humanity of cutting off an arm or a hand and making someone not politically correct is a decision that is made by a judge. You see the right hand you can still exist in the culture. If you don't have the right land, you cannot exist. I have seen what happens when a man is lowered onto a stump and his head falls into a bucket. I have watched five fighters take off and only four come back. I 
I've seen some pretty horrendous things. But to think that this civilized world that we live in still believes that it can take a life regardless of whether that person has taken a life or several bothers me. It bothers me deeply. I will continue to be committed even though I'm asked to shame myself for my commitment to my religious beliefs, to all that I know, because this I will tell you. When you exist in this world today, it is a culmination of all of the experiences that you've had. Good, bad, ugly, different, in contrary to what you believe, or in support of those things that you are deeply committed to believe. I guess I don't have to say it, but I will not support the bracket motion. I will support LB 268. And at the end of the day, there will be a new legislature that will have to make this decision again and again and again. And I'm, I'm convinced that that's true. Because there will be people who One say minute. we need to reinstate the death penalty. And I hope they are as committed as I am to doing the right thing. In summary, I would say this. You cannot look at one man on this floor and say that he is responsible for this decision. You must look at everyone who signs on to they, that bill, this bill, or any other bill, who believes it's the right thing to do. So in just a few minutes, we will take the vote. Join me in doing the right thing and voting for LB 268. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chris. Senator Reapy, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President and members of this chamber. I think the tone of the uh, conversation, the discussion has, has improved. I want to uh, share that I was very disappointed when it started out. It became out as a proposal of who loves Jesus the most. And I don't think that that is a place for this chamber, nor do I think it's a discussion that needs to be. It has a stifling effect on anyone that wants to state some other opinion or who wants to compare their religious status to one another. If I go further, I will talk about some of the situations that are repetitive, but instead of that, I would like to yield my time to Senator Groney because I think he's not had time to talk, and so I would give my time to him if he would accept. Senator Groney, you're yielded four minutes and 10 seconds. Thank you, Senator Rippey. Call the citizens out there, if you wonder why opponents of this bill haven't had a lot of time to talk in our two hours. It's a procedure. Some of us rookies didn't understand it. When a bill comes up first, if you hit your green light that you're here, if you hit the white light right away, you get first in the queue. The proponents of 268 did that and did it well. So you're listening out there. There's a lot we had to say. We're not going to have that opportunity. My constituents know where I stood when I ran. I wonder if some of the folks voting for this told their constituents, we're honest with them, that they're going to vote this way. Because I know what the polls say, I know what people say. People want justice. I was in a convenience store in a small town. I wasn't in my district the other day, and a person recognized me, walked up to me at the checkout, and said, the debt penalty, sir, what's going on in this state? Down there, and I said, vote trading, conscience, lack of it. A young lady behind me, she said, she was at the, at the cash register, said, we were talking about what happened in Omaha. She said, you mean, I've been abused in my life. I've got children. You're telling me if somebody hit me with a baseball bat? And I was laying there and I seen him carry off my children before I passed away. And he took my child alive and threw him in a river. There wouldn't be justice. I said, no. No, they wouldn't. She just about cried, and I did too. Because we got some little white people here, lived in middle-class America, 
never seen evil. They watch reality shows. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart had the most famous quote, I know it when I see it. And I believe the juries, when they see it, and they hear the evidence, they know it when they see it. Comments about Dakota City and, and that we weren't involved with, we weren't there, we weren't the jury, we weren't the three-judge panel, they know it when they see it. They know it when they see evil. And I trust them to do the right thing. So in our lily-white society, who live their perfect middle-class lives, say, we can't pull the lever? Well, God made people who can. We talked about the military. The old saying is 15% of the military is the only ones that actually aim. The other 85% don't. We wouldn't have freedom in this country for that, unless that 15% aimed. But the reality is 70% of the people of this state understand justice, One and minute. they are appalled. They are absolutely appalled at what's going on here. Now, if I see a closure vote and then a vote opposite, I am going to work hard to make sure that person never sees public office again. Is that a threat? That's reality. That's reality, because the people deserve representation of what they believe, not because I wouldn't pull the lever. This is disgusting, and I don't care what anybody says. Collegiality out the window. I represent people. I don't represent anybody in this room. I represent people, and they want justice and they want the opportunity for justice. But we feel personally what we would do. We represent a civil society that wants justice and we demand it. Let the jury decide. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gordy. Senator Cook, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. It is indeed a historic day. And greetings from Lily White, Nebraskans who do not support the death penalty, and who knew that when they elected me twice to this office. I simply want to point out the fact, had the opportunity to visit with some family members of murder victims who testified in support of this measure at the hearing. Here's what we reminded each other of this morning. A vote for this bill does not bring your loved one back. Also, the way the death penalty is meted out by the state of Nebraska, you don't get to use the same methodology that took your loved one from you. It's really quite simple. Greek and Roman symbols aside, we certainly don't want to implement many of the things that were utilized in ancient times as they relate to justice or liberty, anybody in this room, man or woman. With that, Mr. President, I would yield the balance of my time to the champion of this issue for four decades, Senator Ernie Chambers. Senator Chambers, you're yielded three minutes and 35 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Cook. Members of the legislature, it's ironic that this symbol of the sword-bearing woman was given to us, which represents justice, but the scales mean that justice must be done before you execute. William Marion did not have that happen to him. He was innocent and he was executed in this state. And in the 90s, the Pardons Board of Nebraska formally and officially convened and gave him a posthumous pardon it doesn't say they said, oops, the joke's on us, but these people who make these kind of comments have nothing of substance to say on the issue, and those who've talked this morning do. I am pleased at the comments that have been expressed this morning in opposition to a punishment which Europeans refer to as barbaric. There has never been the efforts being put forth to get drugs to take life as is being done in this instance and the one being dealt with has been shown to be a thief. So 
to bring about death on behalf of the state. People can be corrupted when they ordinarily walk a higher road. The legislature has the opportunity today to take away all of that kind of wheeling, dealing, and pretense. When we vote to abolish the death penalty, what we really do is remove a sham. When you have a so-called penalty and it hasn't been implemented in nearly 20 years, that does not fulfill the role of a penalty, no matter what kind of definition you use. The death penalty on the books distorts the system, even though judges know that they're not going to be eager to pronounce a death sentence, even when a prosecutor seeks it in this state, they are well aware of the amount of time that's going to be consumed in appeals, the amount of money that will be spent if there is a death penalty imposed, and it's not likely to be carried out. So the sham is to hold it out there and say this is something that's going to make a difference when it doesn't. Nebraska has a chance to step into history on the right side of history, to take a step that will be beneficial toward the advancement of a civilized society which is showing its maturity and is reflecting a humane sense of justice. And I don't see that as being bad for anybody. As for the letter that Senator Scheer read, I got a copy of it too, and they shouldn't presume that all of us who are against the death penalty never had a relative who was murdered. They talked about a niece, I had a nephew. But I don't bring somebody who has met a very violent, brutal end to tell you this is why you ought to do something or the other. That's something for me to deal with. The people in my district know that I'm against the death penalty, have always been against the death penalty. The family of a young lady time named Senator. Kenyatta Bush, you said time? Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Senator President. Chambers. Mr. Clerk, you have a motion on the desk. Mr. President, I do. Senator Chambers would move to invoke closure pursuant to Rule 7, Section 10. It is the ruling of the Chair that there has been full and fair debate accorded to LB 268. There has been a request to place the House under call. The question is, shall the House go under call? All those in favor vote aye. All those opposed vote nay. Mr. President, we're actually on final reading, which means I should be here, but we can ask the members to check in. Okay? Okay. All members should please check in. This is final reading if you're here. Why isn't it working? <laughs> There's been a request for a Roll call vote in reverse order. Senator, Lar Senator Larson, will you please check in? Everyone needs to check in. Okay, I'm sorry. Everyone, please check in. All members, please check in. Senator McCloster and Senator Groney, please check in. All members have checked in. There's been a request for a roll call vote in reverse order. Did he say reverse? Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. In reverse order. In reverse order. Thank you. Senator Williams, voting yes. Senator Watermeyer, no. voting no. Senator Sullivan, yes. voting yes. Senator Stinner, voting no. Senator Smith, no. not voting. Senator Seiler, yes. voting yes. Senator Shoemaker, yes. voting yes. Senator Schnorr, no. voting no. Senator Shields, yes. voting yes. Senator Shear, yes. voting no. Senator Reapy, no. voting no. Senator Pansy Brooks, yes. voting yes. Senator Norquist. Voting yes, Sir Morante. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Moorfeld. Yes. 
Voting yes, Sir Mello. Yes. Voting yes, Sir McCoy. No. Voting no, Sir McAllister. Yes. Voting yes, Senator Lindstrom. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Larson. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Keen. Yes. Voting no, Sir Christ. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Coulterman. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Kalowski. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Kittner. Yes. Voting no, Sir Johnson. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Hughes. Yes. Voting no, Sir Howard. Voting yes, Sir Hickelman. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Burke Har. Voting yes, Sir Hansen. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Hadley. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Ken Har. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Groney. Yes. Voting no, Sir Glor. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Garrett. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Friesen. Yes. Voting no, Sir Epke. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Davis. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Crawford. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Craighead. Yes. Voting no, Sir Cook. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Coash. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Chambers. Voting yes, Sir Campbell. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Brosh. No. Voting no, Sir Bowles. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Bloomfield. Yes. Voting no, Sir Baker. Yes. Voting yes, 34 A's. 14 A's, Mr. President, on the motion to invoke closure. Motion to invoke closure is adopted. Members, the next vote is on the adoption of the bracket motion to LV 268. All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Have all those voted? Record, Mr. Clerk. 14 A's, 31 A's, Mr. President, on the motion to bracket the bill. The amendment fails. Members, we will now vote on advancement of LB 268 to E&R, to we're, we're on final reading. reading. So we have to dispense with final reading and we'll take a final reading. Okay. okay. At this time, the first vote is to dispense with the final reading. All in favor vote aye. All opposed vote nay. Record, Mr. Clerk. 37 A's, 8 nays, Mr. President, to dispense with the at-large reading. The at-large reading is dispensed with. Mr. Clerk, please read the title. Mr. President, Legislative Bill 268, bill originally introduced by Senator Chambers, Coash, Garrett, Epke, Davis, Coulterman, Chris, McAllister, Williams, Campbell, Pansing, Brooks, Crawford, Hanson, Cook, Mello, and Norquist. It's a bill for inequity in crimes and offenses. It amends sections 23, 3406, 3408, 2411, 06, 1140, 09, 28104, 202, 303, 291602, 2918, 22, 292004, Fifty five four eighty eighty three eleven ten oh two and eighty three forty one forty three reissue revised statutes of Nebraska and sections twenty eight one oh five twenty eight two oh one twenty eight thirteen fifty six twenty nine sixteen oh three twenty nine twenty two oh four twenty two sixty one and thirty nine twenty two revised stats cumes up twenty fourteen. It eliminates the death penalty. It changes and eliminates provisions relating to murder in the first degree. Pre-sentence reports, indeterminate sentences, the Commission of Public Advocacy, and the Authority of Courts and the Department of Correctional Services. It states intent and eliminates a homicide case report, provisions of capital punishment, proportionality review provisions, and obsolete provisions. It harmonizes provisions, it repeals the original sections, and outright repeals sections 241105, 291519, 21, 251, 252103. 0405, 2523, 252401, 02, 2525, 2527, 2528, 2811, 8311, 0501, 1132, 83964, 965, 966, 967, 968, 969, 970, 971, 972, reissue revised statutes of Nebraska, and sections 28, 105001, 2520, 252102, 2522, 2524. 25, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, and 25, 46, revised that cumes up 2014. Senator McCoy. Now I request a roll call vote in regular order, please. 
All provisions of law relative to procedure having been complied with, the question is shall LB 268 pass? There has been a request for a roll call vote in regular order. Proceed, Mr. Clerk. Senator Baker. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Bloomfield. No. Voting no. Senator Bowles. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Brosh. No. Voting no. Senator Campbell. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Chambers. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Coash. Voting yes. Senator Cook. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Craighead. Voting no. Senator Crawford. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Davis. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Epke. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Friesen. Yes. Voting no. Senator Garrett. Voting yes, Sir Glor. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Groney. Voting no, Sir Ken Har. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Hadley. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Hansen. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Burkhar. Voting yes, Sir Hickelman. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Howard. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Hughes. Yes. Voting no, Sir Johnson. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Kittner. Yes. Voting no, Sir Kalowski. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Coulterman. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Christ. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Keen. Yes. Voting no, Sir Larson. Not voting, Sir Lindstrom. Yes. Voting yes, Sir McAllister. Yes. Voting yes, Sir McCoy. Yes. Voting no, Sir Mello. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Moorfeld. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Morante. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Norquist. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Pansy Brooks. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Reapy. Yes. Voting no, Sir Shear. Yes. Voting no, Sir Shields. No. Not voting, Sir Schnorr. No. Voting no, Sir Shoemaker. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Seiler. Yes. Voting yes, Sir Smith. What he knows, Sir Stinner. What he knows, Sir Sullivan. What he yes, Sir Watermeyer. What he knows, Sir Williams. What he yes. 32 A's, 15 A's, Mr. President, on the final passage of Legislative Bill 268. LB 268 passes.